Hey guys, welcome back. So some of you might remember this one. I've already made a video on it. You know, I picked it up, I think it was only about $50. And according to the person I bought it from, it ran well, but it needed a new fuel tank. And sure enough, it did. The tank that was on there had a hole melted in it because the wrong exhaust system was installed. So we put the right system on there and the machine ran and made power, but it had a misfire. So we spent quite a bit of time chasing that issue. We found it had the wrong carburetor, it had zero clearance on the exhaust, and the plug wire was high resistance. So we fixed all those issues and still uh, the engine didn't run right. So I kind of set this aside. I've been procrastinating a pretty long time on this one, but did pick up a few parts that I think are worth a try. Anyway, while waiting to make a part two on this, this machine cloned itself. I now have another that's almost identical. It is a slightly different model, but it has the same Tecumseh engine and almost the exact same setup. So, you know, I don't know what's wrong with this one because someone threw it away. So I say we start there. Let's see if this one has any chance of running. And if it does run, how does it run compared to the other? And if it doesn't run, then we can use some of those parts in troubleshooting this one. So let me get set up a little bit better and get going on this. So this is really my first time looking at it. You know, I haven't done anything to it other than pull it over. You know, I want to make sure the engine wasn't stuck and thankfully it's not, but I wouldn't say there's much for compression either. You know, it doesn't seem like we have a broken connecting rod, but yeah, something isn't quite right there. So I do want to do a compression test. I guess before I do that, we can just check the basics. Uh, the tank I believe is empty but there is a pretty bad smell coming from it. And it looks like part of the cap fell in. So that is something we're gonna have to deal with. I believe there is a fuel valve on here, which was left on. So that is not a good sign. You know, as far as the carb goes, it doesn't look too bad from the outside. Throttle plate's not stuck and the choke moves. Uh, let's check the oil real quick. See if we have any. It's actually hard to tell if it's over full. Potentially there's fuel in there. So let me clean that and just double check it. So let's just double check the oil. That fuel line's not in the best spot. And it looks good. We're right at the full mark, maybe a touch below. So good. Uh, my initial concern was that the dipstick seemed wet quite a bit further up than the full mark. So I thought we could be overfilled or potentially water or fuel had mixed in with that oil. But that does not appear to be the case. So let's get the tank out of the way. I want to double check the compression. It does feel weak, but I've been fooled before. So we'll get a compression tester in there and just see where we're starting at. This line is fairly petrified, so most likely we're going to replace it. And when they're petrified like this, they don't like letting go of the barbed fitting. So a lot of times you, you really have no choice but to cut it. And I think that's what we're going to do in this case. So we'll just cut it right here. And when we put it back together, we'll run some new line. I guess the good news is there's no fuel in the line. So potentially the carb's in good shape. Top of the machine looks fairly clean 
And the plug's not that old. You know, it's been replaced at least somewhat recently. Yeah, not brand new though. The engine has fired on this plug at some point. Anyway, let's check the compression. So what do you think we're going to see here? The other generator with the same Tecumseh engine came in at about 70 PSI. Uh, this does have a compression release. So usually around 60 is what we should see. You know, in this case, I'm thinking it's going to be pretty low. So let's see if we can free this recoil up. Yeah, that, that's pretty low. I mean, we're at, what, about 30 PSI? So it's not zero, but I'd say we do have a problem here. So I'm going to get a bit of WD-40 sprayed in there. Potentially, it's just a little bit of rust on the rings or the valves. And if we pull it over a few times, maybe that number will come up. All right, let's try it again. And now we are pretty much at the same thing. That is likely not enough to get the engine to start. And I guess what I'm wondering though is, you know, is it a valve clearance issue? Is it a ring issue or is it just it's been sitting around so long that the numbers are low? You know, if this engine can run for a second, that might be enough. So I'm going to put a little bit of fuel in there. We'll just try it, see if it'll run. And if it does, we'll double check the compression. And I will say I have had engines with compression this low that run absolutely fine. Sometimes the compression release, it is overly aggressive and just lets a little bit too much out. So starting it might be a little bit more difficult, but once it's running, it does run at full compression. So we'll turn the ignition on, the choke. I'm not sure which is which here, so we'll put it somewhere in between and give it a pull. Wow. It's going to run. Let's try it again. Nice. Got to say, I'm a little surprised. I was not expecting that. So the engine, it is capable of running. I guess the question is, is the carburetor? So let's add a fuel supply and try this again. So I'm just going to use this external tank. We will connect it right where I cut the fuel line. Turn the fuel valve on and see if it accepts fuel. and it is not accepting fuel. So the needle and seat, I would say, are stuck, or maybe we have an obstruction somewhere in the fuel line. So it's not going to run like this. So I'm going to take the air box off, and instead we'll just feed it some starting fluid, try to keep the engine running a little bit longer. 
Then we'll double check the compression. Well, at least we got a filter. It's always a good thing. This one backfires like the other one. All right, so the engine sounds good and it's kind of running well. We did get a pop out of the intake on the other engine. We're actually getting pops out of the exhaust. So yeah, potentially a valve issue. It's really hard to tell until that carb is cleaned and actually running the engine. So that most likely is the next move here. Uh, but before I do that, I wanna start it again like we just did. This time with a light connected, see if we have any output, and then we'll get the compression tester on there again, see if it's come up any. Nothing. It's possible I flooded it. Or maybe the compression dropped. Plug doesn't look that wet, so I'm gonna add a little more fuel directly here. And see if that helps. Do choke open. Nice. All right, well, things are looking good so far. We have power, the engine started, although it was hard to get it to start this time. And I think some of that has to do with just the length of this intake tube. You know, I'm spraying the starting fluid in right here. And by the time I pull it over, that aerosol is kind of puddled and it's a lot less effective. So yeah, I guess things are looking pretty good. Uh, let's get that plug back out, see if the numbers have changed any. All right, let's see what we get. No change. We're still at 30 PSI. So that's interesting. I'm not sure what to think of that. And I'm really not going to know what to think of it until we get the carb cleaned up, get it running on the carburetor, and then we'll put it under load, see if it's down on power or if things are running well. So we'll just start here by getting the airbox base plate off.
And it looks like we got a bundle of wires zip tied here. So let's cut that off and we should be free. So although the carb definitely needs to be cleaned, I'm going to keep going here because I think we do have issues with the valves. You know, when pulling the engine over at a slow speed, I should hit a compression stroke. Even with an aggressive compression release, the recoil should stop advancing, but it never does. So we have high leak down and that compression is going somewhere. And I'm willing to bet either the valves are misadjusted or potentially we need to lap a valve in. So I'm gonna get the intake manifold off. There's just two T30 Torx screws right here, or Torx bolts. We'll get this out of the way and that'll give us access to the valves. I guess the question is, do we need to get the exhaust off in order to get this manifold off? And I don't think it's gonna matter too much because if we find the valves are tight, then we need to pull the head, in which case the exhaust needs to come off because the bracket on the top of the exhaust is actually attached to one of the head bolts. And you can't get the head off with the exhaust installed. trying to save the gasket here. Unfortunately, half of it's attached to the engine and the other half to the intake manifold. Saved it. And the governor springs also attached here. So of course it's a different size. So let me get a different socket. That just means we're gonna to have to reset the engine speed when we put this back together. Graceful. I'm going to rotate the engine. The intake's on the left. The exhaust is on the right. So we want to find the compression stroke. So we pull it over until we see the intake open, which is right now. If we keep going, it'll close right there. And then the exhaust is getting bumped. So that's the compression release. If I go a little further, we'll be at top dead center, which is right there. Now, I haven't looked up the specs yet on these valves. Usually on the flatheads, though, they are pretty generous. You know, I'm guessing at least 10 thousandths of an inch. So let's start with the intake. And actually, it fits fine. The exhaust does not. And a lot of times the exhaust clearance is larger than the intake and 10 thousandths does not fit. So let's try something a little smaller. How about an eight? Eight does not fit. Six thousandths does not fit. Let's try three thousandths. Does not fit. So let's go to the smallest one I have, which is one and a half thousandths. No, it doesn't fit. So we either have zero 
clearance on that exhaust or very close to zero. And that has to be corrected. I'm sure that's why the compression is low. And that's kind of the big drawback, I guess, on a flathead engine. If this was an overhead cam, it would be an easy adjustment and you'd be back in business. In this case, you actually have to take the head off, take the valve out, and grind a little bit off the length of that valve stem. So that's what we're going to do. So what do you think the odds are of these bolts coming out? They don't look too happy. So we have some tabs bent over here. We need to straighten those out and then hope we can crack these free without breaking them off. This one's coming out pretty easily. Did I forget something? Don't think so. <laughs> but it's not coming off. It's fairly clean in here, actually, considering how old this engine is. And the head bolts, they were fairly loose. So I'm kind of wondering if someone didn't already come in here recently trying to figure out this problem. Anyway, these are the valves right here. We have the intake, that's the larger valve, and the exhaust. And right now we're just a touch, 
I think before top dead center. So right there is top dead center. And we'll just go a touch past. And right now the valves should be tightly seated. Uh, the intake is the larger valve, cannot spin it. The exhaust is the smaller valve and that spins without issue. So yeah, the exhaust valve, it's not fully closed and that's why we're having the low numbers. Anyway, we gotta get the valves out. I'm gonna lap them both in. We will take some off of this to get the clearance we need and then clean things up and put it back together. There we go. The valves look very clean. I mean, considering the age of this engine, I don't think it's had a lot of hours or maybe it was recently serviced. I mean, there's only minor buildup on the intake and same thing with the exhaust. So these will clean up with minimal effort. Uh, once they're cleaned, we'll get the clearance we need on the exhaust. And I just realized I never showed you the head, but it's kind of the same story. Not a lot of carbon buildup. So that should be fairly easy to clean up. So a piece of Scotch-Brite and a bit of WD-40. and just spin it in the drill while holding it to the valve. Makes quick work of it. Good enough. The intake's gonna take a bit more work because it does have some buildup on it. Huh. Intake valve looks bent. I think we're okay. Thought the intake valve was bent, but I think it was just the way the chuck on this drill was holding it. See there, it clearly looks like it's wobbling if you look at the stem there. And the problem is it's tapered on the shaft right there. So the chuck really can't get a accurate bite on it, but this one does better. You see how it spins nice? So I think we're okay. So I'm gonna be the first to admit, this is not the proper use of this tool. You should only use it like this on the rest. 
but I'm trying to make a flat surface here and using a round wheel isn't really gonna accomplish that. So what I usually do is hold it like that while spinning the valve. And this kind of holds things steady and you want to try to keep it as steady as you can. If you move it around too much, you're going to end up with a pretty bad surface. You know, no matter what I do, it's not going to be as good as this. You need something better than a grinder. But it's what I have. And it should fix the issue. So I've been taking my time every few seconds going back to the engine and dropping the valve in and checking the clearance. It's supposed to be 12 thousandths on the exhaust. Right now we're at about nine. So you gotta take your time. Because you can't put material back once you take it off. So right now we're at 11 thousandths, actually somewhere between 11 and 12. So I'm not going to push my luck. I'm just going to take the burr off and call it good. All right. And there's an up close look at the end result. I think it came out pretty good. I mean, right now we're kind of between 11 and 12 thousandths, which is pretty much perfect. And the intake, we actually don't have to touch. This one is supposed to be 8 thousandths, and currently it's at 10. So it's a little bit over. You know, there's no adding material back. When the valve's lapped in, it actually might take away a little bit of clearance, bringing it closer to spec. But either way, you know, if it's a few thousandths off, it's not the end of the world, but if it's zero, which is what this was, then it's going to cause a problem.
And as far as cleaning up the head goes, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not going to decarbon anywhere in the piston area. And actually by the valves is really no buildup. So I'm going to leave good enough alone there. You know, I don't want to get any junk caught in the rings, but I do need to clean up the old gasket material and get this surface prepped for reassembly. A little bit of valve lapping compound, and we'll try to use the suction cup to lap these valves in. Uh, the last Tecums that I did this on didn't like the suction cup, so I actually bought a new set because they were getting kind of petrified. So hopefully the new set works better. So I've dropped both the valves back in and neither one spins, just applying a little bit of light pressure on it. So that's what you want to see. I'm just going to double check the clearance. You know, the intake is exactly at 10 thousandths. The exhaust, 10 thousandths fits in there just fine. The 11 fits with quite a bit of drag. So we're actually closer to 11. Uh, which is fine. You know, I'd rather have it a little bit on the tight side than take too much material off. Anyway, let's get the springs on. We'll close this up 
and double check the compression. There we go. I'm going to reuse this gasket. I did order another one just in case, but this one came off clean. So I think we'll be okay. Worst case, when I do get the other gasket, we can just swap it out. We'll get the governor spring back on. Luckily, there's a nice clean spot where that nut was. So we can set it back pretty close to where it was. That's close enough. We can fine tune that later. So I put a little bit of oil on the threads and I'm also going to put a little bit of oil on the washers because, well, there's a lot of rust. When I torque down on this, I don't want the, the friction from the rust changing the torque value too much. So these get torqued down to 200 inch pounds and there is a torque pattern, but you know, if you don't have it, that's okay. Just do it diagonal. Don't do them right next to each other. Let's spin the engine over, see if we actually build compression where the flywheel stops advancing. And we do. So it wasn't doing that before. I could just keep spinning the engine right through the compression stroke and it wouldn't resist. So that leak down issue is definitely fixed. So before I get the tins back on, I'm just gonna take a second and clean what I can off of this machine. You know, this side, it's actually not too dirty, uh, but there is a ton of aluminum oxide. And this stuff, you know, you're not going to get it completely off, and even if you do, it's just going to come back. I mean, this is aluminum's equivalent of rust. But we'll get the loose, powdery, caked-on stuff off of there, and then move to the other side where there is actually some oil. We'll use a bit of WD-40, to clean that up.
despite the label right there, this does not control the speed on this engine. There's no linkage going over to the governor, there's no spring. It's purely to turn the machine on and off. That's bugging me. Big difference. I'm pulling pretty hard right now. <laughs> and it's not advancing. I mean, that is night and day. So let's get the compression tester back on there and see where we're at now. So what do you think? Is it gonna be 60? I think so. It feels a lot better when pulling the engine over. And before, we were consistently getting 30, and I think that's being a bit generous. I, It was actually lower than that, probably closer to 25. So let's put the compression tester there. We'll just focus in on it, and we'll give it a few pulls. Hopefully, we get 60. One pull, we're at 40, 50. That looks like 60 to me. Yeah, we're exactly at 60 PSI. So this engine should run quite well, I think, now. You know, the way it was before, it would have been severely down on power. And most likely when the engine warms up, you know, that clearance would have gotten even worse on the exhaust and the engine may have stopped running altogether. Anyway, we need to clean the carb. I think before we do that, let's just get the intake manifold back on as well as the exhaust. We'll get the carb opened up, see if we can save it. And if we can, we'll bolt it back on and try this thing out. All right, I'm gonna start by cutting the fuel line off. This just has a plastic fitting. And especially with a petrified line, you know, you could really do some damage on that fitting if you try to just pull it off. So in this case, we'll cut it off. So we'll get the clamp out of the way. And it looks like I can clip it a little bit higher. And then, actually, I think slicing it with a razor might be the way to go here. Otherwise, you can use the side cutters and kind of nip away at it. But let me try the razor first. And, of course, the razor can cause damage as well. So, go easy. Okay, so we've got that off. So we'll get the nut off the bowl. Yeah, I do hear a little something in there, which is not good. It's, I'm sure it's ancient fuel. So this is an adjustable jet right here. We'll just leave that exactly where it is for now.
Yeah, we got some water, some old fuel, and I'm not sure what that is. It's like gel. But the bowl looks good. I mean, that'll clean up well. Float looks fine. We got a plastic float. You know, in the older engines, you'll have brass, which tend to leak. The plastic ones are usually pretty good. So yeah, things are looking pretty good in here. There is an emulsion tube. It is removable. I usually don't remove them because the plastic tends to get brittle and I crack them pretty easily. This one actually might be brass, but I'm going to leave good enough alone. If it does not run right, we can always come back and pull that out. You know, it's not a big deal. We also have an adjustable needle here for the pilot circuit. So let's just check where it is now. That's one, one and a half. So we'll get that out. I'm actually surprised this didn't take fuel. So we'll double check the fuel inlet just to make sure it's not clogged. Yeah, that's mostly it. So let me test the flow here real quick. I'll probably use the vacuum pump. We'll try to basically pull a vacuum and it shouldn't, you know, it should allow air through the seat. If we build vacuum, then we know we're clogged up. So we'll connect one end right here and the other end to the vacuum pump. Right now, I'm just gonna block the output. You can see we're pulling a vacuum and we're holding. So when connected to here, when I pump it, we shouldn't pull a vacuum. But you can see we're actually pulling a pretty decent vacuum. It is bleeding off. But I think that's a little too slow. So we might, might have a problem here. So I'm going to put some fuel on the line. And see if it comes out. Should be coming out right there. And it's definitely not. So we are clogged up. And that might be an issue because this does have a rubber seat or neoprene seat. And it might need to be replaced if we're going to clean that up properly. But let me just try right here. I was going to say with a zip tie, but I can see down there without issue. So I don't think that is the issue. You know, we could try blowing some air through there in that direction. So yeah, let's give that a try. See if it clears it up. I was going to say you could use carb cleaner. That would clear it up, but it would also destroy that, that seat. So we can't do that. Ah, there we go. All right, that should do it. Let's put a little bit of WD-40 in there. We'll blow that through as well, and we'll do the same vacuum test. Actually, we'll probably skip the vacuum test and just go back to the fuel test. And I can tell we got flow, just a bit of WD-40 going in. And it's coming out in the carb, so... Yeah, that, I think, solved the issue. So there's really no need to put fuel through it. Okay, good. So I'm going to spend a second, just make sure all these passages are clear. And then I'm going to put this in the ultrasonic. Usually I use the Harbor Freight Super Heavy Duty Degreaser, but I recently put one of these Tecumseh carbs in there. And it had a pretty violent chemical reaction with that. So in this case, I'm just going to use some dish soap. It's not as effective, but it's a lot safer. And, you know, I don't want to damage this carb. These carbs, if you buy an OEM carb, they're pretty expensive. You know, I think around $70 or $80. So I want to be careful not to damage this one. So 
So besides the clogged inlet and the junk that was in the bowl, I mean, this carb is actually pretty clean. All things considered. You know, most carbs with water in it would have rusted. Okay, good. None of those were clogged. And I am going to see if I can get this off. And I'm going to use a bit of carb cleaner just to blow, you know, or to clean out this pilot circuit. I do need to be careful. I don't want to get any of the cleaner on that seat or with the emulsion tube is because that will distort the rubber that's there. Hmm. Might have a blockage. I should see that coming out, those little holes right there, and I don't. And I don't want to go crazy with the carb cleaner because I'm going to damage something over here. Let me see. So that that small hole, I think, right there, that might be the passage that goes through the pilot circuit. Yeah, I think we're okay. Cleaned up pretty well. All the dirt and debris are gone. So let's get it back together. Starting with the needle and the float. Now, although this is a plastic float, this float height is adjustable. So we'll double check it once we get it assembled. You know, if adjusted properly, then the float should be just about parallel with the car body. And you can see it's close. We're actually a little bit high on this side, so I'm gonna adjust it a bit. And I guess we're gonna to have to do it the right way. So we'll take this back out. And that tab right there, we can just bend down a little bit. Kind of like that. Yeah, it's nice that this float height is adjustable. A lot of the newer carbs, you cannot adjust that. This carb also has an adjustment on the main jet, which again, on most carbs made today, you don't have that. So yeah, we're... We're pretty close. I think I'm splitting hairs at this point. I think this will be pretty good. So we'll just get this O-ring back on. And the bowl has this flat right here, which should align with that portion of the float. If you don't align it, then the float's going to be obstructed and things aren't going to function the way that they should. So we'll get this pilot needle back in. And one thing I failed to realize when I took it apart, there should be a washer and an O-ring, uh, kind of like we see here on the needle for the main jet. And when I took this apart initially, both this washer and the O-ring had stayed behind. So I had to fish 
the washer out of the ultrasonic because it did release when we were cleaning it. So make sure you don't lose that. Without that, you're going to have an air leak and it's not going to run right. So let's turn this in until it stops. It was at one and a half, so we'll set it back to one and a half. And that might need some adjusting once the machine's running. So we are, seems like we're all the way in. So we'll back out half, one, one and a half. And then this is for the main jet. This one was close to one and three quarters. Might have actually been a touch less than that. So we'll get it close. All right, we are bottomed out. So half, one, one and a half. We'll do it right there, just shy of one and three quarters. So that should be it. Let's try it out. So I'm wondering if we should get a fuel line on now. Yeah, we got plenty of room. We can put that line on later. You know, for now, anyway, I'm just going to be putting on a short piece of line for testing. So let's get the gasket in there. And try to line things up. All right, the bolts are through. Almost forgot, we need to bend these back. I'm just putting some fuel in the line. want to see that the needle and seat work and we're not flooding over and assuming it does we'll start it real quick you know the air filter is not on so it may not run perfect i can adjust the jetting but you know we'll just get it running good enough to see that we're out of the woods on this one yeah i want to say we're good but the level is slowly dropping so that needle May not be fully seating. Yeah, we are flooding over, so the needle and seat, they're not playing nice. Uh, that said, I do want to get it going, though. I want to make sure we're out of the woods on this one, and then I can place an order, get a new needle and seat.
All right, not too bad. You know, it started rough. The jetting was a little off, so I had to adjust it. Things smoothed out quite well. And this one, also not running perfect. It does have a slight misfire. You know, I'm not quite sure it's as bad as that one, but it makes me feel better. You know, a lot of people commented after the other video I did on that other generator that theirs does the same thing. They have the same model. It runs the same way. There's nothing wrong. It's just how this model runs. And I'm starting to agree. So I'm really curious how this one's going to perform under load when compared to the other one. You know, I'm expecting it's going to be about the same. So let's finish this one up. We'll get both of them outside. We'll put both of them to work and hopefully they perform in a similar manner. I guess this one's earned its oil change. So we get it changed now while it's hot. Wow, that was on there. And I'm gonna make a mess, aren't I? Let's get the form of funnel. The oil that came out looks pretty good. So I don't think we have any internal issues with that engine. Gonna use the good stuff here. Rotilla T5, 10W30. And I believe this takes 720 milliliters. I think we're right there. So while we're waiting for the new seat to arrive, I'm just going to turn my attention to this tank. It does need a bit of work, you know, starting with the fuel cap. You know, we lost the seal. It's inside the tank and it's actually damaged. We can't put it back on because the other part of the seal is right still on the cap. So although the cap is fine, you know, I'm not able to source that part. And without it, that's gonna leak. Uh, luckily, I do have another one that has the seal we need. So assuming it's the right thread, then I think we'll be all set, which it looks like we are. So that I'd say is no longer an issue. Uh, the other th couple things I need to deal with, the fuel filter actually is bent and I do hear some other debris in there. So we're gonna have to fish that out. The bushing here on the bottom also, it's not cracked, but it's very petrified and it's not forming a tight seal. So if it's not leaking yet, it's gonna leak soon. And I think we need to get that replaced. So yeah, there's no easy way to get the seal out, especially when it's petrified. You really just need to carefully pry it out, hopefully without damaging the tank. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to flip it back over and add just a bit of fuel to the tank. I'm going to use this tool with a towel on the end and just mop it up. There was what looked like dirt inside the tank. So I'm hoping that'll clean it out well enough to get this tank back to good shape. bit of dirt came out not as much as I was thinking but we'll do that a few more times just make sure that we're clean in there yeah 
Yeah, pretty clean. So I think that's going to be it for now. Um, the fuel that's in there, I'm going to leave in there. There's not a lot. And if we could take the fuel valve and the bushing out, we then can just completely drain what I just put in there. And this cap is now fighting me. There we go. And I can tell you, this is going to be a lot of fun. When they're this petrified, getting the old valve and the old bushing out, it's usually pretty hard and requires excessive force. So yeah, let me get some tools. Maybe we'll get lucky. Kind of doubt it. Let's apply a little bit of leverage. You just want to be careful not to damage the tank. It is an old plastic tank. It's probably not as strong as it used to be. And you don't want to damage the surface, especially where it goes in. You know, that's the area that has to make a good seal when you put the new bushing in. actually kind of coming out. <laughs> it's like right there. Come on. Maybe if I use this as a little bit of leverage. So close. All right. So you can see the filter. It is damaged. We don't absolutely need it. You can see someone already put one right there. So if the valve still works, it might be better just to remove the filter and rely on something in line. But let me double check. I might have a new one of these. Yeah, it looks like I do have a brand new one with a new bushing, new fuel filter. So I think this will be the way to go. Assuming this tube comes off. Yeah, it's like the same exact thing it looks like. So I'm going to spend a second just clean the surface up and drain out what fuel is left in there. And then we'll install this new fuel valve. All right, that's pretty much it. Uh, there is still something in there rolling around, so let's fish that out. To get the new bushing installed, you're going to need a bit of oil or some sort of lubricant on the inner diameter. There we go. And that just gets inserted first. And then on the fuel valve, the same thing. You need oil or something right here to make this a little bit easier. And the idea is it's just a compression fitting. So when these are pushed together, we should have the seal we need. Yep. 
So that should be it for the tank. You know, we need a new fuel line. We technically do not need an inline filter because there's a filter right there on the fuel valve. So I'm going to get this, I think, back on the generator like this. We'll cut a fuel line to size. We won't connect it quite yet. And once we get the carb fully fixed, you know, we can make that final connection. So this showed up today. This is a kit which includes the needle and seat and a few other rebuild parts. So we'll get all of those on as well since we're in here and we have new ones. So to get the seat out that's in there, in the past I have used just a screw. You know, it's something everyone has. You just literally screw it into the seat until it gets nice and tight and then pull it out. Uh, there's also a Tecumseh tool which has the equivalent of a crochet hook which does the same thing. But this usually works. So that is the seat right there. And let's just take a look down where that seat goes because the seat has to seal not only on the needle side but on the carb side. You know, so potentially there could be some debris there. You know, in this case it's kind of hard to tell. But I would say given that we had a blockage right there, might be prudent just to spray that out, maybe run a Q-tip through it and make sure that that is clean before putting that new seat in there. Yeah, actually, it's pretty dirty in there. So I'm going to do that a couple times, just make sure it's as clean as can be. And then we'll put this back together. Just take note, both sides of the seat are not the same. One side is smooth and the other side has a rib on it. The rib goes down and to insert it, you can use a drill bit of the right size or this tool, which does a little bit better job because it holds the seat so it doesn't flip over while installing it. And you just push it in until it bottoms out. And in this case, it's not going down very easily. So let's push it a little harder. Oh, there we go. So the seat is installed. So we'll set the old seat aside and we'll get the new needle.
And you can see it's actually misadjusted now. And that's because the needle is going further in than the old one. So most likely the old seat was swollen. Uh, this tool also has this part right here, which is actually the gap you're supposed to set for that float. And right now, you can tell it is out of adjustment. So we'll have to bend that tab back to where it, probably where it was originally. Yeah, we're right there. So I'm not gonna tweak that anymore. I think it's good enough. That should be it. Let's just pressure test it and make sure. Actually, I think a better test would be just to fill the bowl like we did last time. Keep an eye on the fuel level. It should stop accepting fuel and it should not kind of inch down like it was before. And this is probably a better test too because gravity fed systems, they don't see much pressure, less than one PSI. And that Mighty Vac gauge really doesn't measure anything less than 2 PSI. And even something like that could push past the needle and kind of give you a false sense that there's a problem. And in this case, the fuel line is right there. And it's not advancing like it was before. So I think it's safe to call this one fixed. So I'm going to pause it here. I'm just going to get it back on the machine. And I'll meet you outside. All right, I think we're pretty much ready to go. And I can confidently say my neighbors, they're not going to like me today. You know, these 10 horse engines, they are quite loud. And I'm not testing just one today. I'm actually testing three. Uh, they're all 10 horse Tecumsehs. The one on the right is a separate video. You'll see that soon. But the one on the left, you've seen before. This is the one that is misfiring, I think, severely compared to the others. Now, they all misfire, especially without a load, but once it's under load, it should smooth out. So that's what we're gonna be looking for in that machine today, as well as this one. Now, getting it under full load, 5,000 watts, is actually gonna be a bit of a challenge. Uh, the load bank, it's wired for 240 volts. You know, that said, it actually breaks it out into the 120 legs. And to do that, you need a neutral. And this generator, as well as the other one, it does have 240 out there on the bottom, but it's 240 only. There is no neutral. So I can't use the load bank, and there's only two plugs on the 120. And these cords are only rated at 15 amps each. So when pulling the max, we're actually going to be putting 21 amps through each cord. So we don't want to do it for long. Anyway, let's get the engine started. We'll double check the engine speed. We might need to tweak some of the jetting on that carburetor. And once we have it dialed in, we'll bring on 3,000 watts, see how it does, and then we'll bring it up to 5,000 watts.
All right, this one lives up to its name. Tecumsehs, they give me trouble. And this one is no different. You know, at least it started first pull, uh, but the engine was not running well. It was surging and a lot of black smoke. So that told me it was running rich. So I made a quick and dirty adjustment just by turning that needle on the main jet in and the engine recovered. Now the pilot needle, I did make an adjustment there by holding the throttle in the idle position and dialed that in pretty well. But the main jet, you know, I can't really adjust that truly until we have a load on the machine. And once I put 3000 watts on, the engine stumbled and went to stall. So the jetting was still off. You know, I had to take that load off, put on the most load I could, and then dialed in that main jet. And at that point, the engine had no issues handling 5,000 watts. Now, when I took the load off, the engine was running fast at 65 hertz, and no adjustments I made would fix that. I actually pulled the idle set screw out, made no difference, backed off the spring tension, made no difference, and I manually pushed the arm all the way into the idle position, and that really made no difference either. But if I actually grabbed the throttle plate and turned it, the engine would slow down. So likely the governor's out of adjustment. It just can't close that plate enough to slow the engine down. And as the engine warms up, that plate needs to be closed further. And I think that's why when it was cold, it had control of the speed. But once that warmed up, the governor just couldn't close the throttle enough to bring that speed down. So yeah, I think we need to make an adjustment here on the governor calibration and try this again. That's kind of hard to show you here, but hopefully you can see the governor and the linkage going to the carb. So this spring holds the throttle and wide open throttle, which is where it is right now. And we want the governor shaft to rotate in the same direction that brings it to full throttle. You know, in this case, it is clockwise. Now on most machines, you would just loosen the clamp that's on the shaft and rotate that shaft clockwise until it stops and tighten down. On Tecumsehs, it's actually a little bit easier. You just have to loosen this bolt right here and pull this tight, which will pivot these two parts, but it will also rotate the shaft. And once it stops, you just snug that down and the adjustment should be complete. So you see how that moves. And we just tighten it up. And hopefully that'll do it. It should. All right, I put the idle set screw back in now, when the engine starts, assuming everything's adjusted right, it's just gonna idle. You know, that spring tension I took off, so we will reset the speed back up to 61 hertz, and then bring the load on at 5,000 watts. We'll let the engine build some heat. We'll turn that load off and see how it does.
I wouldn't say that was the result I was looking for. You know, without a load, we started at around 61, maybe 61 and a half hertz, and under a full load, that speed came down quite a bit to about 53 hertz. Now, despite that, you know, I did see the throttle plate moving, like the governor was reacting. So, you know, I think I need to increase the spring tension to fix the issue. The problem is if I do that, then the engine's gonna be over revving without a load. And the more I look at this carb, the more I'm kind of suspicious of it because right now I have the idle set screw all the way out. And when holding the throttle in that position, we're not even that close to idle. It's still running at almost full speed. So I'm thinking maybe there's something wrong with that throttle plate. And you know, if you look at these other machines, that idle set screw is quite a bit further out. And if I hold this in that position, you know, that machine idles. And the same with that one. That screw is out quite a bit. And the idle position is against that screw. So, yeah, I think there has to be something wrong with that carburetor or maybe the throttle plate. So let's get it off and take a closer look at it. I think I see the issue here. The throttle plate, although it looks fine and it's closing fully, if you look up here where the idle set screw is and that metal plate right there, that's what goes against the idle set screw. And the throttle plate isn't closed until this metal part is right up against the carb body. And if you look at another carb I have, it's a Tecumseh carb. Similar design, but a little bit different. You can see when the throttle plate is closed, like it is now, if you look at that metal piece that goes against the idle set screw, there's a good, I would say, quarter inch gap between that and the body of the carb. And that kind of agrees what I was seeing on the other machines. Those idle set screws were out quite a bit further and those machines idle. Whereas this one, if you put that screw in at all, it's gonna immediately open that throttle plate. And being that it's so far out of adjustment, the governor just can't handle it. And the plate on top, I noticed if I hold the shaft still, you can see that plate is super loose. So unfortunately, something happened to this carb. The orientation is no longer correct. So I think we need a different carb. I guess the question is, do I have one that's compatible with that machine and is in running condition. That I am not sure of. So I'm gonna pause it, take a look around, see if I can come up with an alternative. I came up with this one right here. This is a clone carb that is fairly new. You know, I think it runs well. You know, I guess the only downside about it, besides being a clone, is that the jetting is fixed. There's no adjustments. So hopefully the jetting's correct for this machine. Anyway, even if it runs the engine well, it's not a perfect swap. The fuel fittings are different. And this one also has a connection for a breather, which we don't need, so we can cap that off. I think the bigger issue is just rerouting the fuel line for this carb. Anyway, let's give this one a try and just validate that we don't have a governor issue, that it was a carb issue all along.
that was quite a bit better. Uh, this time I set the no load speed at close to 60 hertz. It was a little bit hard to tell because the engine was surging without a load. But then we put a 5,000 watt load on and things smoothed right out. The engine actually sounded great. There was no misfiring and the engine speed was virtually unchanged under that kind of a load, just below 59 hertz. So this one, with the exception of the carb, I would say is done. So let's drag it out of the way and bring this red one out. I just wanna do a quick load test and listen to the engine compared to what we just ran. Cause this one I think has bigger issues. So let's try it out. Actually, before I drag this out of the way, I'm thinking let's try to get this working right. It's really close. We just need to drill out that pilot jet. You know, as far as this connection here for the breather, we can just cap that with this plug. And the fuel line, it can be routed right between the flywheel and the engine. That's usually how Tecumseh's are. So the fuel line routing, it's not really a big deal. So let's get this jet out. We'll bring it up maybe one or two micro drill bit sizes and we'll try it again. So that one's a 77, doesn't really fit. We'll try a 78, which is actually smaller. And that one fits on there quite well. So let's, let's grab the 78 and we'll drill it up one size and try it out. And one thing just to note, these drill bits, they do break off in these jets. So don't do this if it's your only jet. I have a whole bin of these. And I actually just checked an OEM Tecumseh jet. And it's compatible with this carburetor. So if I mess this up, you know, I can swap it out easy enough. And the OEM part was the same size. I was hoping actually I could just swap it out without having to drill it. So that, that's going in there quite easily. I don't think I actually opened it up much. So I'm going to bring it up one more jet size. Okay, that should do it. Let's try it out. That was quite a bit better. No issues surging without a load and no issues handling a full load. So this one, you know, with the exception of routing of that fuel line, I'd say is done. So let's drag it out of the way and swap it for the other.
Once we get this started, I am going to set the pilot jet needle and the main jet once we have a load on it. Last time I had it running, I was kind of tinkering with these, so I am sure they need some adjustment. No issues with this one. It ran just as well as the one we tested earlier. You know, both were fairly easy to start. Both ran rough when cold. And as the engine warmed up, they ran quite a bit better. But without a load, they misfired. And as soon as you put a load on of any kind, the engine smoothed out and ran quite well. So, you know, I had planned on digging in on this again and making another video. I actually bought a valve spring a new valve, a few other parts. But based on this test here, I don't think there's anything wrong. It's just the nature of the beast. These all run like that, including the one behind me. So yeah, based on that, I think we're good. So I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.